I want to change the name of Ask Homestead. Homesteady defends itself. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Homesteady Defends Itself. Uh, this is the weekly show where some people think we did things horribly and we defend ourselves. <laughs> Lacey, our goat, had the most intense birth I think we've had yet on our homesteads. Yes, other than mine, right? Other than yours in the van. I've got. One foot, I think. <laughs> oh, your camera lost. So we're going to dive into that today, answer your questions about Lacey's goat birth. Did we do anything right or wrong? Let's dive in. It's funny because coming into this, I'm thinking... I don't want to act like always defensive right. of what we're doing. Yeah. I think because a lot of our viewers are homesteaders themselves or farmers or wannabe homesteaders. We are all coming into this with ideals of what we will do, what we're doing, that it's right. But we also think that everybody else and this niche with us are going to agree and, and think everything we're all doing is right. We all think we should feel the same way about everything, right? Yeah, and the truth is, we don't. No. <laughs> and that's okay. We've right. talked about this before. It's okay to disagree. Especially in homesteading when so many decisions are to be made every day. Different types of animals, oh, yeah. the care of them, the health of them. And we all choose to do things differently. So I feel like what we should just throw out there, we do this from time to time. Um, just remind everybody it's okay to disagree. Yes. It's okay to think that we did something wrong. The reason we do episodes like this is not to defend ourselves, not because we feel we owe anybody an explanation. Sometimes our, our super fans are like, you don't have to explain yourself, you do you. Uh, mostly it's to help educate those who are uneducated and haven't yet made a decision and not to argue with any of our fans or anybody who thinks otherwise of us just to kind of explain why we make the decisions we do for those out there who may someday have this decision to make, maybe we can help you make that decision, whether it's to do what we did or not. Right, kind of giving our perspective of the whole thing. Oftentimes the videos don't show every second, every minute of what happened. So it gives everybody a perspective into what we were seeing and what we were dealing with on our side. Yeah, she's like arching, this is great, this is, if you have ever seen anything in labor, you know that is a goat that's entering labor. Hi, how you doing? The first question that we have, and I'm gonna preface this by saying this is a fan of ours. Uh, she's watched a lot of our videos, has plenty of nice comments, but she definitely didn't like this video. So Jennifer says, normally I support your lifestyle and channel, but this was so wrong. I'm dumbfounded that you would do this. Not only did you cause unnecessary pain to the mother, but then you wiped down the kid of necessary nutrients for the mother to recover and pass on to her baby. Your arm is the same width the mother needed to push the kid out. She didn't need your intervention. That only caused more pain. And you covered your arm with antibacterial gel that effectively killed the good bacteria he needs to protect himself naturally. This was wrong all the way around and will only hurt the genetic strength of your herd, which is costly and cruel to the animals. The only in intervention your herd needs is good fencing and shelter and quality food slash water source. And no, I'm not some vegan animal activist. If anything, I'm the polar opposite of those misguided people. So I responded to Jennifer quickly in the comments section, uh, but we wanted to address uh, Jennifer's comment because she wasn't the only one who felt this way. Also, let's see, Muhammad says, I don't know why you guys interrupt goat birth. It is completely wrong. You can only interfere if she is very young, like less than a year old or very old and lost her tooth already, or she is small sized goat and got pregnant from a large sized buck. In fact, you should not be even there bothering her unless she takes more than many hours since she enters active birth. So right at the gate, Muhammad, Jennifer, and others felt that we should not have intervened. That's their feelings. So we want to talk about why did we intervene with Lacey's birth? 
this is what I was referring to when I was talking about perspective. The, that's a different perspective than I have. If, uh, if Jennifer just said they need a shelter, fencing, and pasture. In my experience with goats, mine have needed more than that, uh, especially because we're not living on a thousand acres where the goats are just left to forage on their own and breed and birth. So we have these two dairy goats who were freshening for the first time. Gizmo we talked about before, we weren't there when Gizmo had her babies. She had them in a quiet area of the barn by herself, but she didn't have the mothering instinct right away. We had to intervene with that in a noisy way, as some pointed out, but uh, effective. She now feeds the kids, she takes care of them. It worked out. Lacey, the same way, as we're watching her go into active birth, we're noticing that she's not making any progress. Also, the kid is presenting wrong. Normally when a kid is born, you want to see feet first. Whether they're front feet or back feet, feet first. He was coming out face first, so we saw his mouth and a little tongue. You can see in the video this little tongue moving. And she wasn't making any progress. She wasn't getting him any food. <coughs> Even though you could tell she was in a lot of pain and <laughs> hysterics, which oh, is yeah. saying noisy pain, he wasn't progressing at all. I want to add quickly to that point about pain. We have observed this would be our fourth or fifth goat birth. Yeah. And we have never seen a goat. Scream like screaming that. Screaming like that. She, we have seen goats screaming like that, but it was when they were dying. Yeah. Not ever during a birth. So we could tell there's something different about this birth and something not right. But we weren't seeing progress. We always encourage people when you're getting into an animal, a goat, a cow, sheep, chickens, ducks, whatever, to have a mentor. Uh, I thought you were going to say to be well lubricated with antibacterial lube. No. But you mean when you're getting into an animal. Yes. When you're physically. starting. <laughs> when you're starting Couldn't to. Couldn't help myself, sorry. <laughs> to have livestock. Have somebody that you know you can call who's had experience with this. So I had studied up on goat kidding positions. Every time we're about to have, have an animal give birth, I study up on it. Okay, what should we do? What's right? What's wrong? But we also called our mentors. Uh, you can hear us in the video. That's who he's on the phone talking with. Yeah, I disappeared for a few minutes, and it wasn't like, "Sorry, Kay, you got to deal with this." It was because we were like, "Quick, help!" So I give them a call. We told them what position the kid was in, face first, feet back, and she said, "Well, you got to go in and pull those feet around." And that's what we ended up doing. Now, this was good advice from our mentor, and uh, we feel good advice for anyone who is presented with a face. First, no feet, uh, doe or buck birth. And based off of some advice, not just from our mentors, uh, there was a good art, a good part in uh, Goats for Dummies, right? Mm -hmm. What did it say in Goats for Dummies? So Goats for Dummies was written by Cheryl Smith. Cheryl Smith uh, is a goat. Midwife. Mid she she's into goat midwifery. Uh, she's written three or four books about raising goats. She's owned goats for uh, decades and great source of information for goats. In the book, Goats for Dummies, she talks about kidding and she talks about problems with kidding. One of the positions that a position that can cause a problem is front legs back. The birth is stalled and you see a nose, sometimes a tongue hanging out of the mouth, but no hooves. Like that kid has its legs back and unless it's very tiny, it won't be getting out with, without some veterinary help. There's a reason animals, there's an ideal position for them to give birth in. Think of hooves forward. Think of even back hooves forward. It's making the shoulders be as narrow as possible to fit through the pelvis and come out. They call it the diving position. Diving position. A diver wants to make as little splash as possible. That's kind of the same principle. Yeah, now think of arms back, face forward, your shoulders are wide. And if it's a big kid... Which it was. Which we, we knew afterwards, he was a very big kid. It's going to be really hard to get that animal out on their own. 
that's why we're keeping close track of the girls. That's why we see when they're bred so we can give an estimate of when they're going to give birth. We weren't there for Gizmo, unfortunately, so we had some cold kids right away. Fortunately for Lacey, we were there before she got too tired and before the kid was in any distress. When the birth is delayed, they call it dystocia. Am I pronouncing that correctly? I hope I am. Uh, there was a really great article from the University of Arkansas. I'm going to have links below for all these that we mentioned. Uh, they talking about goat kidding, but again, goat dystocia, that's a delay in the labor. It says your does will normally deliver their kids in about 30 minutes. It goes on to say, you need to be prepared to assist does that have dystocia. Those that are not accustomed to being handled can suffer from additional stress when you attempt to assist them with kidding. Now, I thought this was very interesting because it talks about does that are used to being handled and does that are not. Some herds are kind of set loose on, you know, 100 acres and you see them once in a while. Our does, we handle actively every day. So it says, on the other hand, does that are used to being handled may be better off when you assist. They appear to relax once help arrives. So basically, the takeaway from that article, which you can read for yourself, link below, is... If your goats are handled frequently, they will view you as help. And if you don't help a doe with dystocia, there can be problems, even death. So Jennifer's question, why did we go in? Why did I wipe the kid off? Why did I use the, the lube with the antiseptic? I went in because I wasn't seeing any progress because he wasn't positioned in the normal birthing position. I went in to kind of see what I would have to do. He was a big kid, so he needed to be in the right position to come out. The lube is what I had on hand. Ideally, I would have washed up with soap and water, would have put on a glove. I had the lube with the antiseptic, so that's what I used. For the goat births, we're done this season. We have cow births coming up, so I'm going to make sure I get some of the OB gloves, which are the long kind. It's a good idea to wear a glove when you're going into an animal, not just for the animal's sake, but also for your sake, to keep both of you healthy. It's one of these areas where we continue to learn as we do this. Um, we have some, we were, we were, we did good. I feel absolutely we did good, but we can always have room for improvement. So no, we didn't have gloves at the ready. Next time we'll have gloves at the ready. As far as the problem uh, Jennifer has with the antibacterial uh, lube, this is one of those areas that homesteaders will disagree about. Some people think antibacterial soap is horrible. It's causing horrible problems. It should never be used. Uh, some people would reach in there without having to even wash their hands. There's a spectrum. That's, that's something we try to keep our minds very open about. So I'll use, we've said this before, I'll use an herbal warmer, but I'll also use some safeguard if I notice real white and sick goats. I think depending on the degree of the emergency is where we pull out the bigger sized guns. If we're dealing with a minor scrape and cut, we could put some salve or balm on it. And if we have dystocia and we just get a dive in there and rearrange the goat, we're gonna just grab the antiseptic lube and do what needs done. Sometimes you just gotta get your hands dirty. Uh, when pulling legs around, be careful to cup the little hooves of the kid so you don't tear the doe's uterus just for anybody who is watching this and needs to do this. And what did you do as you were reaching in there? Because we didn't narrate what was going on in there. Uh, it, that's the first time I've done that. It was really hard to tell what was going on, if there were multiple kids in there or anything. I had to reach in much further than I expected to find those and to pull them up. And thankfully, I found both of the right ones. Yeah, that would have been <laughs> them up. Uh, the next time, I would hopefully have somebody there to hold her. Standing was easier to get in and see what was going on, so I was glad she was standing up, but I would have her restrained in some way so I wasn't having to walk and follow her all over the barn as she was standing. So Marge, as well as a few others, wanted to know, because you had to go in, did you then follow up with antibiotics for Lacey? This is what some goat, goat keepers will do they'll automatically, even cow people, will give antibiotics after they have to go in for the birth. We didn't choose to do that, but we did monitor, mon we did monitor her to make sure she, she wasn't getting a fever or she wasn't sick in any way. This is again a good example of the natural versus, you know, more 
uh, what's the word, natural versus, uh, I don't know why versus is the word. The spectrum we talk about, uh, some people would right away throw the, those antibiotics in. We That's are okay. not opposed to using <laughs> antibiotics. We talked about that recently in a video, how we use pigs, uh, we used antibiotics with our pigs. But it, we didn't see any need to, Lacey's temperature and health were stable, and so we didn't just throw them at it. So. This is one of those things you always look back on. A big thing that happens, even your own birth. If a person you're giving birth, you look back and you kind of think about it. So looking back, thinking about it, things we would do different. I would make sure I had gloves on hand. I think I, I liked, I was very happy we went in when we did because Lacey still had the energy to push. And the kid was in really good shape. He stood up so quickly and started nursing. We were really happy with that. One of the things Kay was really concerned about is because it presented face first. Yeah, I was concerned that he, that it was a stressful birth because he was so big that he was going to be dead. Which is why right away when he came out, you saw me wiping him. So wow, be, well, wow, that's a big one too. Wow, look at the size. What Making sure you a little rug to make sure he's breathing. It wasn't to wipe all everything off of him. I went back and watched the video and I stopped wiping about halfway shoulder, yeah, yeah, halfway. So and then I put him right in front of her and she started licking. It was all there for her still to lick up all around him and yeah. you could tell it it worked. She that is her baby. <laughs> She's been a very good mother. So in my belief I do not think I have harmed the genetics of our herd at all by doing the things that we did. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that that has altered or harmed the genetics of our herd at all. It's interesting because in the comments there show the spectrum of opinions. Jennifer thinking, you know, let nature take its course. Muhammad thinking, just stand back unless there's a serious problem, don't get involved, don't even be there. And then other commenters like Remington, which is a great name, says, <laughs> Lesson to all these people who think, I'm just gonna breed some goats. If you're not willing or you're too scared to go in and reposition a baby, you should not be breeding goats or any animal for that reason. Good job, guys. This is not unheard of to have to go in and reposition a goat kid, especially if you're dealing with twins or triplets maybe, even if you're dealing with sheep or calves, especially with a first time freshener, you kind of have to be on your toes. A couple commenters talked about how, you know, we think about a lot of times people say, why don't you just let it be handled like nature handles it? You betcha asked, boy, goats are such drama queens while birthing their kids. It makes you wonder how they could ever survive as a species. Making such loud screams, surely that would draw in every predator with it within 10 miles. And then another commenter talked about in the natural world, uh, Levetta said, wondering what would have happened in the wild. And I thought that was something good to remember because we do talk about from time to time in this channel, channel the natural myth. The idea that we should be farming exactly like nature, replicating nature in every way, and that that would solve all our problems. If we just treat it like nature, it'll solve all the problems. Now, we agree that it's beneficial to model our, your farm, your homestead, after what would happen naturally. So goats are naturally a high browser. Right. Uh, it's not good for them to graze. That's where they pick up the parasites. So if you could model your setup yeah. after what they would do in nature, it's great. We are striving every day to get more and more replicating the natural world in our systems on this homestead. But you have to remember agriculture is not nature. Our goats are still confined much more than wild goats. And on the flip side, nature is not this kind, kind mother. mother. <laughs> People talk about mother nature can be cruel. The wild is a cruel place. Uh, I figured I would pull up a study to reflect what happens in nature. The Pen state of Pennsylvania did a study about white-tailed deer. And I figured they're pretty close to goats. If you imagine goats in the wild, we don't have a lot of wild goats running around Pennsylvania, but we have lots of white-tailed deer. And they were studying fawn mortality. Uh, so what they did is they looked at a couple hundred fawns that were born and they tracked to see how long they survived. And they found in this study that about 50% of the fawns that were born died. Why? 
just like one of our commenters said, predation was the number one killer. Uh, so here on the farm, we don't have to worry about predation for our goat births. But second to that was natural causes excluding predation. And I'm just gonna read a clip, but again, you can read the article below. Uh, natural causes excluding predation were the second leading cause of mortality, 27% overall, and the leading cause of mortality in a different study, nearly 73%. Some of the reasons, uh, maternal abandonment was one of them. Insufficient milk, if they found if the does were not healthy leading into the birth, they would reject their fawns, leaving them to die. Younger does are known to be less capable of caring for fawns. So that's natural, the, or, that's natural causes, right? Is trouble in, in birth yeah. or uh, just abandonment. So in theory, if we took the approach of let's treat our farm exactly like nature, Stay away from your goats when they're birthing. Just let nature take its course. 50% deaths is not something I would want to see. And if you look at the way both of the births have gone on this homestead this year, there is a very good chance we could have seen a 50% mortality rate if we just let nature take its course. So we don't, <laughs> we, we like to take a proactive approach to medical problems. We have sadly lost animals in the past. We don't like having animals die on our homestead if we can avoid it. And so we do not let nature take its course. We are a little bit more proactive than probably some of you are and maybe less proactive than others. Part of that spectrum. Yeah. We did have a couple questions which I thought were really good. Uh, do you think you call Craig a super fan at this point? Is Craig Moore? Yeah, Craig. Yeah. Craig super fan. Welcome. I, if I knew, I knew his last name. So yes. Yeah, Craig asks us a lot of questions. I like Craig. Sometimes he agrees with us, sometimes not, but usually he understands why we made the decisions we make. Uh, Craig wants to know about our med box. It makes a lot of sense to have one ready, but I've never seen any of the other homesteaders I watch even mention one. I think it would be a great segment if you were to do a show and tell on that. So Craig, that would be a lot to throw into an Ask Homesteady, but I think it's a great idea. So yeah, for an entire video. We're getting ready for Luna and Ladybug's births. We're going to be stocking up on a few extra things that we don't currently have uh, for that birth coming. So uh, stay tuned. Craig, and actually not only Craig, but uh, of Little and Light, also is getting ready to have Dairy Goat kidding and wants a med kit video. So, all right. Um, I think we're going to break this into a two-parter because there's still some really good questions. This one's running long. You have a lot of good questions about milking. Now that you have seen us milk once, uh, our milking routine, our milking procedures, you want to know after seeing two births that needed assistance, are we planning on breeding Lacey and Gizmo again? So what do we think there? Uh, That'll be in part two of this Ask Home Study Goat Birth Edition. So